Hi everyone and welcome back to the Club Iron Podcast with uh, with me, Alex, and uh, Tanesh's uh, finest fitness entrepreneur, Matthew. Hello. Uh, we're joined by uh, by a Frenchman today who uh, who's claimed the uh, claimed a British citizenship. Uh, he's uh, under seventy four British champion powerlifter, under seventy four junior third. How do you say it? How do you, how do you say your title? Because Bronze medalist. Bronze medalist, there we go. So, uh, so Antoine, introduce yourself because a lot of our listeners won't know who you are. So, hi, my name is Antoine Darmon. I am uh, the current uh, junior and the 74 kg junior champ. And uh, I have recently competed at IPF Worlds uh, Junior and I've ended SUD. That was, that was impressive. That was very, very, very impressive. I was watching the videos and, and this man, I, I mean, he does look strong, but I don't think... Some people really understand the amount of weight this man can put on his back. Like it's actually, it's actually crazy. I mean, me and Matthew were talking about it, and Matthew was just like, "I can't believe." Like, yeah, when Alex put put you forward as a guest, I obviously looked through your profile, and uh, I was quite astounded of how how heavy you can lift. So, do you just want to tell everyone about your numbers and um, what you did in the IPF Worlds? Um, to be honest, my IPF was performance was not something I quite liked. Mm. Uh, I was quite disappointed by the way I performed. I was expecting the ranking to be honest. Um, I was expecting to be to be sad coming into it, uh, but I did not like the way I did it. Mm. So, talking about numbers, uh, my best squat ever is two hundred and fifty two kilos. Uh, my best bench competition is uh, one forty seven point five. Although I've done one fifty in the gyms in the gym before. And uh, my best deadlift in competition is 285 kilos. Wow, that is, uh, that is some numbers. Um, so I just want to ask you first off, how did you even get into powerlifting? Was it like a sparked interest? Did you do it before you came to the university here? Or did, was it like a university thing? You joined here, you saw the clubs, you thought, you know, I'll give this a go. And then next thing you know, you're pulling, pulling deadlifts in the world. <laughs> um, originally, I was not planning on doing it. I was doing a lot of just like general things. I was into calisthenics before actually. And um, I do not know coming into uni where I would go as a tour club and stuff. I was just like doing my own thing, not really minding, like doing a specific sport. And then uh, I met the guys at the UCL Barbell Club. Originally I was never UCL, I was in another uni, but my uni was so small, so little and had so few clubs. And it was like 80% girls and 20% guys. So obviously, like, for, you don't, you're not going to find a sports society there. Mm. And um, I mean, there was no sports society. And uh, in that case, I decided to join the UCL Barbara Club. And um, what, just randomly, or was there like a, a reason why you decided? <laughs> originally, oh, powerlifting. Because origi- it could have been anything. They have so many sports clubs there. Originally, I got the offer for UCL. And uh, I was okay. debating going either for UCL or my uni. But my uni was better in my, in the specific field I was doing in undergrad. Mm-hmm. So I decided to go there. But UCL was still on my mind. Because uh, we also had like a public club and stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm kind of interested in that. Yeah. So I went there. And uh, I was pretty much like the strongest 74 that powerlifting. And when you started? Yeah. Yeah, because you told me you told me about this, and I've seen uh, eagle lifts from you back in the day, sort of like doing yeah. some really st- was it like T bar rows, like yeah, I did T bar rows with like six, seven plates or some shit like this, some bullshit like eagle lift, yeah, and yeah. Uh, no, like I, but I was be- squatting one seventy kilos, and then lifting two hundred. Wow. My fingers, like I was kind of like at the time, obviously not the case anymore, but like I, I was like. Like with his numbers, I would not be first now, obviously. But like, well, no, no, but I, you must have, you must have thought, right? There aren't many other people who have as little lifting experience as me who are already sort of making these sort of gains. Did you think, okay, I have potential here? You must have thought that quite soon. Not before. The thing is, did you uh, not know what the benchmark was for you to be able to lift? No, I would just lift them by myself, and I did not know what people, other yeah. numbers were. So I, just I thought, think when people start the gym, they don't realize the difference in strength. Obviously, when we went to that uh, powerlifting event in 
Swansea. Oh, the equipped. It was equipped. Yeah. Like I, th- I didn't. I never thought it was strong at all. But I thought I had some like you know, measly level of strength. Yeah, you think that? And then I went quality. there and I saw that guy squat four four two point five. Bear in mind he was equipped, um, which four four two point five still weighs the same. And he was about three hundred fifty. Still fuck kilos. weight on your it's leg. A lot, yeah, it's, it's a lot still a lot. But I was like so blown away by that. And people don't. I don't think people understand how strong people are. Yeah. You know, they yeah. see like you see like bodybuilders and stuff who are obviously very strong. Like a 72 kilo bodybuilder, or I don't know how that works. And you compare their strength to a 72 kilo powerlifter. I know the objectives are different, but I don't think people realize how how strong powerlifters yeah, are. Bodybuilders will get strong um, with you know by building muscle mass. Yeah. Because even as a powerlifter, and you can speak on this, you know what what would you say then? Because obviously, you know, bodybuilders can can get really strong, especially with the press. Yeah, they can mm. push like 100 kilo dumbbells and isolation like movements, especially as but, well. You know, what's your what's your view then on the sort of gaining strength in bodybuilding? You think you can do it through bodybuilding too, or do you think the best way is just to just to cut out all the all the crap in between? Um, it's more like there is. <clears throat> it's more like it's more it's a greater area than this. So obviously, having bigger pecs, having bigger triceps, having bigger shoulders. What about all, what about stomach? Sorry. How about? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lucky, I'll. Anyway, all of this will help you. Yeah. Like why would why wouldn't it? But the thing is, um, the best way you can ideally, and I and I really mean ideally, build muscle is through SBD, because if you squat, you will build your legs in a way that will help you squat more. If that makes sense. Yeah, you're gonna practice something by doing it over and over again. It's not just the movement; it's like you will literally develop a musculature that will help you achieve, like. Just a bigger squat. But the thing is, the, the only problem with this is that um, not everyone can handle uh, just doing SBD, like at least like squat and yeah. and deadlift, just to build the legs. Not everyone can handle the volume because, like, yeah. <laughs> like if you are like a very long femur individual, it's going to be really hard to accumulate a lot of volume on your legs mm. on squats. Your lower back might just like fatigue before your legs do and then in that case it's interesting to have like an accessory for your legs however in an ideal world if you can do most of your like leg volume on squat and deadlift then it's ideal but upper body wise it's a bit more nuanced because like for bench it's it's always really useful to do tricep extension it's always really good, good to have like overall accessory to just make your upper body bigger what do you think of, uh, you know, like Russ Wall now? He's a 84 uh, champion powerlifter. 83. 83. 83 and then 82.5 in the USPL. 84, um, 84 is the women's weight class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just keep talking, thinking about the women's weight class because that's what I uh, identify. That's where you days. compete, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's, he's got a lot of muscle, that man. Yeah. He does. Um, and he... I think he. I think he's competed in bodybuilding recently as well. He is going to. He is on the road to. Nope. I believe. Nope. He hasn't competed. No. So he has competed. That was years ago, okay. and he was going to compete, but then he got the an offer to compete in South Korea, in the USAPL division of South Korea. Because uh, saying USAPL Korea just sounds so wrong, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he uh, he was going to compete there, but then I mean he was going to compete in bodybuilding, but then he got invited there, so he dropped. Bodybuilding. He's not with his bodybuilding coach yeah, anymore. But he still trains in a power power building. Um, I hate this word. I know. Okay. Well, you can debunk that. First, I then. hate this word. I hate the word power building. Why? It means nothing. Like, like basically, what is power building? You do SBD, and then you do accessories on the side to become bigger. That's exactly what I do. This is powerlifting. <laughs> this is powerlifting. Yeah. A, a power power builder is just a power lifter who um who wants to get bigger. Who, which is what powerlifters should aspire to become. Yeah, you will naturally progress and sort of get bigger with SBD as well. Because obviously you become so dense. Like I, this type of lifters or type of people we saw on that powerlifting event, I just I was looking at them, I was thinking they're just dense individuals. Well, the guy who scored a four four two point five was about six foot five and he had probably you could you could have fit Antoine inside of his stomach. You know, you know what they you know what they're like. One twenty yeah. plus fat guy. Was he fat though? Yeah, enormous. Like he was like round, you know, like a proper big guy. Like, mm. But he was strong. Yeah. Obviously insanely strong. I just want to talk about the squat to you quickly. You said about it being hard to 
sort of get strong on legs. Do you think that's due to people's like lack in mindset? They don't have the ability to take it there mentally. No leverages. No. Like at some point, it's like, uh, can you do fifty-one reps, fifty-one working reps of squats a week? and be unscathed the week later to perform with the same RPs as you did the, the week oh before. God, this was my problem. So I'm not too clued up on the, the way the powerlifts is trained. Are you able to just break that down for me? Okay. So... I just so, wanted to know, because yeah, I've, I've, I've wondered this for a while. Like, I mean, as a bodybuilder, or as a, somebody who trains in that fashion, it's 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 hard to sort of digest the, the different ways in which you just kind of do SPD all the time. Yeah, because I have a friend who's go, who is going to compete in New Zealand. Uh, for Wales, and she like, tells me about her training and stuff, and I just have no clue. Does she know who one one is? She does. She does indeed. She, I, I told her we were going to do a podcast there, and she was like, "Oh, whoa!" I was like, "Yeah." So I think you're quite well known within the powerlifting community for good reason, obviously. Yeah. But whenever way. she tells me about this, I'm like, she tells me about like, oh, "I got to do this, I got to do that." I'm thinking, I'm like, obviously trying to be like, "Yeah, you know, yeah, get it done." But yeah. I don't have a clue about it, and I feel bad because I want to know, you know. Well, so that's, if you, that's if, where this one comes in. Yes, so if you're able to just break it down for me, I much yeah. appreciate that. Uh, do you want me to break down my own training? Just generally how it how it Just all works. Because I think your own training as well is probably higher volume than mine. Yeah, I than tend to people. be I tend to be someone who's like very geared towards higher volumes. So you're, uh, you're just fucked. Yeah, because I'm just five five. I'm like seventy four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've and I've short femurs and stuff. So obviously I can handle a lot of volume. But basically powerlifting training nowadays is hyper specific bodybuilding training. You spend a lot more time than before. On this, like before, there was like this. Me, if you can't like deadlift like more than once a week, you can't squat more than once a week. I've deadlifted four times a week before, and, and with success. Nice. <laughs> I mean, not everyone is going to be able to like handle this frequency, but however, yeah. there should not be a dogma about like how many times you should do SBD. I mean, you should not SBD. I know guys who do several SBDs a week. Really? Yeah, I I've done, was, like, I've done that. Once a week, sort of thing. Oh, I've done that. Yeah. I know guys who do three SBDs a week. Uh, I got that shit, Sitco actually was the best 76 kilo junior in the world and second best open. She does six SBDs a week. Well, she, that's, that's her entire training then? Yeah. Just SBDs? Yeah. That's cool. The thing is... That makes sense. A lot, that makes a lot of sense. That's hyper-specific uh, bodybuilding. You try to build muscle around the competition movements. Yeah. Because this is where it's going to be the most helpful. And then on the side, you try to do movements that just like, you know, like... I'm not using my biceps a lot when I deadlift. Mm. So obviously it's going to be useful to have like, it's like a bicep curl in general, you know, just to get a little bigger. Big guns. Big and strong. Yeah. But no, like basically it was a goal. Like hyper-specific bodybuilding training, like like generally a common uh, structure would be, actually I have, I actually have a normal structure right now. Mm. We like day one. Uh, that's, that's, that's rare. Squat bench. Day two, uh, the lift bench. Day three, something like maybe another squat, then bench or like accessories. I have just accessories on that day. Mm. And finally, the last day is uh, SBD, and it's like squat bench and deadlift. Mm. Uh, because like just for the one for the viewers who are listening, SBD day means squat bench and deadlift. You do all three at the same time. Yeah, and well, that, but that doesn't mean because one of the misconceptions people are going to think now is that if you work up to like a single, you do an SPD, people may just assume that you go in one rep max on all three lifts. Oh, no, no, And this no. is the thing that I think a lot of people who aren't familiar with bodybuilding, they tend to think this. They tend to think that powerlifters are constantly training to max. You know, they're training to failure. They're always training to their max. And they're like, why did you leave two in the tank there? You didn't train to failure. That's where RAR comes in. Yeah, it's that Reps in reserve. Yeah, reps in reserve. Even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's your RPE, right? So maybe you could... RPE equals RAR. Like people that go like, oh yeah, but RP is a more subjective measure of that. Like, come on, it's like we need data. We need like things that we can actually like rely on. Yeah. All the sub- subjective crap is like, how do I usefully like rate that? And therefore, in my opinion, RP is RER mm. because it's just a more accurate way to just like assess the difficulty. Not only that, people that say RP is subjective. Small people that go like heavier, and they say, "Oh yeah, no, no, hundred percent RP eight. It felt that way, and it's like, yeah, but like we've done two more reps, and it's like, well, you see, 
Yeah, I, I'll say something as an RP8 only because it was supposed to be an RP8, but really it was a 9.5, and I didn't really enjoy the fact that it was a 9.5. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, like, also, like, generally when you tend to use, like, RP as RA art, you tend to undershoot, and you tend to, like, have, like, generally overall less difficulty. Yeah, so so just to break that down then, RP and RA are so... If it's an RP8, the representative reserve is two. Yeah. So RP8 means you should have two left in the tank after that, so you're always undershooting. So what are, what are the benefits of actually not training at max? Then obviously you're squatting a lot. You're not going to want to go max all the time. But why yeah. would you Why would you undershoot? Because for a bodybuilder, they're thinking, no, nah, no, nah, you've got to train to failure. That's when D load comes in. You know, a lot of people try to progress all the time, and they do like a six-week block of just training to failure. So like maybe RP10. I don't know if you can compare them with bodybuilding or... I'm not entirely or, sure you would do six weeks of RP10. No, but a lot of people like sort of just try to push the failure. In bodybuilding, they push the failure for like six weeks and then they take a deload week. Is that the same in powerlifting or is there like more to there, it? There is value, but specifically for bodybuilding. The thing in powerlifting is that if I really... Okay, let's say it this way, right? If, especially as you get stronger, let's say your max squat is 400 kilos. Mm. So... Imagine pushing an RP 10 single when your max is 400 kilos. How must that feel on your body, especially in the week following? Mm. The problem is like, if you like, this becomes more and more true as you become more advanced, although it's really good to ingrain good habits when you start. But if you try to go RP 10 all the time, the problem is that that's days of wasted training that follow because you're too fatigued to actually put in meaningful work, meaningful volume work on your SBD. You might have to take out the weight for a few days, like take down, like, you know, go lower in weight for a few days. And the problem is like, that's actual wasted time. That's why I don't ever max. I don't ever go RP10. Even even up to a comp, like would you, would you ever test to run that max leading up to a comp or would you just not do that? Don't test it. Just do it on the, on the platform. Keep it. Like, yeah, like keep it. So if I was to start powerlifting tomorrow, what would you? What would the first pro- protocol be for me? What would you say to, for me to do? I'd try to get you familiar with RP, rating your RPs. I will probably give you low reps just because I, if you're like really truly starting powerlifting, I'll probably give you low reps because you probably do not have the proficiency in your movement to do sets of six or eight, mm. although we're going to do them. But you do have yeah. you do have muscle mass. This is what I was telling you. It's not a case of you need to build more size to get stronger. It will come. But I was telling you, I think you need to just lower the reps a bit and focus on, you know, your CNS a little bit more and just get stronger. Because the people, you know, he's got the legs to squat. It's just... Oh, know, not me. Yeah, you, okay. you're, okay. doing, you're, you're doing like sets of 20 and stuff like that. Do you know something about like CNS is actually more recruited during longer efforts and short efforts? How do you mean? Like more longer sets? You know what are which people actually require more CNX, like have more CNX exertion are actually people that run marathons. Really? How's that? Yep. It actually is way more taxing on your CNS than uh and you'll tell anyone who has run like a marathon after like after they run the marathon, they will tell you that they literally like their motor functions are actually fucked. So when Michael Hearn does a four plate bench to warm up. CNS, it's not really. No. The thing is, the like, Nazi Michael Hearn. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> Nazi King. Nazi King. <laughs> the more I speak to you, the more I start to understand that obviously powerlifting is all about numbers, but the training seems to be a lot more technical, I believe, in bodybuilding. That's like the more I'm, uh, well, oh, of course, the more I'm speaking fun. to you. Uh, you know, it seems to be very statistical, numerical, and systemized. It, it is very much like that. It's more so like because we are a performance sport and powerlifting is not. So you do not have like landmarks that you particularly need to hit in bodybuilding, unlike powerlifting, where there is a game on numbers, there is a game on ranking. And it's like, obviously, if you're in a national competition, you will make calculations on indexes, like on body weight and weight lifted. You will make calculations on totals just to see where your lifter can place the best. Yeah. Like that's a li- that's So that could include not overdoing yourself on squat in order to really go on deadlifts right yeah i have like secondary days and i'm not pushing them purposefully yeah like i'm not like, yeah, what i mean is in competition too you might not actually outdo maybe your your squat attempts maybe to go on deadlift i see that sometimes and i watch competitions 
sometimes the judges will say, oh, I think what he's doing is because he's got a huge deadlift, this guy. He's, he's not going to, to kill himself on squats so that he can... That is a good decision it. because you can put more weight yeah. on a deadlift than you can put on a That's squat thing, in so that it, scenario. Not, yeah, it's not about the absolute best you can... Well, it is, but it's a strategic game, it seems. I mean, obviously, I've never competed. I want to ask you, actually, more about your training now as an elite powerlifter. I'm going to call you an elite powerlifter because you've earned that now. Um, so maybe tell me about the differences then between when you sort of started training before you actually made a made a name for yourself. Like, what's your training like now? Is it much different now or is it just the basics that you've always really sort of stuck to? Mm, I wouldn't say my training is that much different. I squat overall one less time per week. But at the same time, I have higher reps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. scary. Uh, Can't wait. <laughs> no, it's, it hasn't changed that much, to be honest. A lot of powerlifting is also a lot of like finding an appropriate amount of volume and repeating the cycle. So it's just rinse and repeat. Yep. A lot of powerlifting is it's a joke. And like coaching and powerlifting, it's a lot of control C, control V. It's like... <laughs> yeah, cause you, no, because you said, you, you told me this before. You said um, that when you went into your next block, so like when you go through prep and you go 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 back again, you said like you you ba- you basically changed nothing apart from like a couple of a couple of things here and there. Yeah, the thing is like, why would you change something that's not broken? If you've made amazing gains on a cycle, just run it again. Yeah, it's what, like, like we made amazing gains in our trend cycle, so we're gonna do the same thing next time. Do the same thing again. <laughs> You must be speaking of some mythical cycle because uh, I've not made amazing games. <laughs> yeah, I know trying hasn't worked for you. It must have been some dodgy bad. I think I need a refund. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. No, but like, yeah, if it's working, why stop? Like, just for the sake of doing like a strength phase? No. If you've made amazing during a volume block with overall more volume, it's like, right again. And um, that's why like, the idea in powerlifting that you need absolutely need strength blocks, volume blocks, endurance blocks is like flawed because. But you need to do forty five minutes of mobility before every session, right? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Waste my time too. And adductors as well. You got to smash them out. Don't for, don't forget the squat plug too. Obviously, yeah. just stay tight. You know. So can I ask? Stay I've heard I've heard a lot of <laughs> talk about blocks and different like sort of phases in powerlifting training. So how does a contest prep work? So say now if you've got a, how long is a contest prep? 16 weeks? 12 weeks? Four. Four weeks. Like, because, see it this way. The thing is, uh, I mean, prep is when basically you've decided you're going to do a meet. That's it. But I'll, although it's cringe to say above 12 to 16 out, weeks out, it's a bit cringe to say I'm 36 weeks out. Yeah, that's a long time. That's <laughs> six. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I see it this way. Like, the thing with blocks and shit. The thing is, like, people would tend to think before, oh, you need to do, like, an endurance type of block, then a volume block, then a strength block, then a peak block. But the thing is, do you need that, though? Like, if you've made a lot of gains on a volume block, if you go onto a strength blocks, you see your strength going, like, uh, like, down. Maybe the reason is because you're not, you're being under-trained. You're maladaptating. Adapt, mal- mm. Instead of doing adaptations, which make you stronger, you're regressing. Maybe because you were not on the the correct dose of volume, then you go back up in volume. And it's like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Yeah, like there is this um, threshold of volume where you tend to feel better, like a range. And going too far away from it uh, can uh, really sometimes detrain you, uh, because there is a difference between being fatigued and being detrained. Like this block, I've actually increased my total amount of reps by like seventeen or like eighteen. So I have more work to do. I tend to be more fatigued. I'm uh, more fatigued, but performance is still there. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can still go in, perform how I, you want. I don't know how you can do that. Kinda, kinda, kinda. But the thing is, like, uh, so I know that once that volume drops a little back to what it was, I will feel better because I will be. I'm trained right now, but I will be less fatigued. Mm. And. Um, when you get, uh, sometimes like the problem is you can get to volume that are like so far apart, but you can just get detrained. Like you just forget how to squat. When you say detrained, what do you mean? Uh, by detrained, I mean, you forget how to squat. Uh, when your max is 260 on squat and 220 feels heavy on your back. Yeah, would that just be sort of mental fatigue? 
that could be that's why like sometimes the signs of fatigue and like being detrained are very similar however fatigue calm like if you're really fatigued and really high volume blood that makes sense if your numbers are shit in a, in a blog that is supposed to be lower in volume, mm. that's concerning. And um, that's why you need a night to catch it. But basically, um, there is that. And the idea that like, you absolutely need like very different phases is wrong in that sense. Yeah. Because if you go way too far in terms of volume, then in that case, like you might get detrained and not even know it. Uh, because also one thing, if you try to, and that's really important with powerlifting and what you call specificity in sport, if you really try to have phases that are so far apart, the qualities that you gain in one phase are not going to transfer over to the next phase. Because they're opposites. They're too far apart, yeah. Mm. Like, it's called specificity. You need to stick as close to the sport as possible. Like, I've seen people like, I will not give names. <laughs> But it's go bad. On, go on, go on. I dare you. I, I've got. <laughs> I've seen people, um, whether athletes come out of meets, they just only give them sets of ten, like six by ten. And it's like, why would you do that? Six by ten, so sixty reps total. Yeah, it's like, a lot. It is. But it's like, why? For what purpose? The thing is, like, oh, like yeah, we're going back to volume, and it's like. Yeah, but like your athlete has had like 20 reps a week like for like weeks and then you making them jump back up to like 60. It's then very like, like why would you do that? Period. It's like not only that, it's like they just come out of competition. They're peaked. And people think, oh, like there's a lot of fatigue coming with a peak and stuff. Yes and no. There's fatigue because you lifted heavy and you pushed reps. However, that fatigue tends to go down quite easily. Again, the CNS is not as perturbed like long term, but like short efforts mm. or by longer efforts like a set of eight will be more taxing like a heavy set of eight will be more taxing on you than a single but yeah, yeah I can, I can, I can I'm gonna i gonna find out all <laughs> this stuff find out uh, yeah, they'll, yeah. They'll, they'll be like don't worry but basically uh, I mean I hope nah heavy uh, basically uh, basically the thing is like if the athlete is picked right, that means their fatigue levels are low that also means their fitness levels are high Fitness, fitness levels for powerlifting specifically, as in they're able to handle heavy weights. Mm. Why would you put them on six by 10? Would you, you want to take advantage of this situation? Like the athlete is not fatigued. Mm. They can, they're used to heavy weights. Push them a little. My, my best blocks have always been out of meat blocks. Yeah, you told me about this because you said most, most powerlifters will... Um, go back and do their volume straight after. But you say you go back in the gym and you're still lifting heavy because you've got the fitness. You don't have that through a lot of your prep, do you? A lot of your training. Yeah. I say like four weeks for me for prep but because I use these four weeks to peak. Mm. It's like I train, I train, I train, control C, control V, as you know. The peak block is the one block that is different for me. So what is a peak block? Can you, can you break it down? A peaking block is uh, basically this. So you train all year. You make progress. You, you bust your, your ass in the gym, right? Your SBD goes up. However, you don't even realize it, but all these blocks, all the accumulation of these training blocks, again and again and again and again, after ju with just like a week of deload here and there, mm -hmm. you still accumulate fatigue doing this. And it's not fatigue, like one deload can just like, like sort you out. Sort you out. Like you still like, like do a lot of work. And, um, uh, the, the deload is only here to set you back a little so you can push again a little. Set you back a little, push you back a little. Mm. But the thing is, like, you don't actually get rid of all the fatigue you have accumulated. The peaking block is where you you actually, like, get rid of this fatigue. The role of the peaking block is to increase fitness so touch weights are heavier. So your body gets used to it because, like, jumping to 260 to 300 is kind of... Hard, you know. Like in a, yeah, it's a lot of weight, forty keg. Yeah, it's a big jump. Uh, one I wouldn't I wouldn't take personally, but I mean, I'm in the future, but we'll see. But the thing is, like, you wouldn't want to do that. So you tend to increase the weights of your singles, like increase intensity, but at the same time, volume drops a bit. Mm. And the thing is, like, the point is, like, the point is to increase your fitness, but also to decrease your fatigue. And then you like. A peaking block is basically a peak and taper. You peak, you peak, you peak, you raise your fatigues. 
with your levels. And then you have, uh, personally, I have almost two weeks where it progressively tapers down, mm. down, 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 down. I, I lift less heavy and less heavy. And then on competition day, I feel way stronger than ever in the gym. This is the bit that fascinates me the most about competition and powerlifting is the way that you can sort of defatigue yourself and, and increase your fitness and get stronger by sort of calming down and everything. I think it's so much more fascinating than the bodybuilding prep, I think, which I don't understand that much either. But uh, let me let me jump now to something else, to psychology, mm. um, to what goes on in your head. So I was going to ask about this as well. Okay, yeah. well I've got that first. So you just just let me ask my my, my important question here. So uh, tell me about elite level psychology and competition, and also sort of the psychology that happens when you, I suppose, compare yourself to other lifters. Like, is there is that sort of psychological battle, a mental battle with other lifters, or is it just inside you? You know. Yeah, because you seem to be competing. Obviously, you're competing with other people, but obviously, you're competing with your own numbers. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? So in powerlifting, there is always context to everything. And whenever someone, like, whenever I'm in competition with someone, mm. it's never really just about how much they lift in the gym. So, so if they can put it up on the platform. And um, to be fair, powerlifting is a bit boring in that sense. Like, you kind of know how the rankings are going to look like. Mm. But again, uh what like there's always context to these numbers as in if you put up a total at junior worlds in turkey it's extremely different than if you put up that same total at a local meet mm. i would argue that the guy who did it in turkey is way stronger is that uh, strict rules uh, pressure conditions when i came to turkey i left my house at 8 a.m i arrived there at 10 p.m after that, they did not have a room for me. I had to wait. I waited two hours. I was in my room at midnight. It was uh, 40 degrees all the time. I did not have AC the first night. Uh, there was that. We were warming up in a room where it was like five countries per rack, five lifters and two coaches each in a very packed warm-up room. That was, and it was 45 degrees in there. It was in the middle of the afternoon. I drank five liters of water and did not go to the toilet. So that... Uh, so you just like sort of <laughs> evaporate. Everything was against you, basically. That's what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, the thing is, before doing Worlds, I was like, people were saying this. Like, Worlds, it's different. And I was like, no, no, you know, it can't be that bad. I did it. And wow. It Surely did. they can set it up in a way that supports you as the lifter. I mean, I'm sure they're I mean, not, yeah, they're not out same, to get you. But, same, but surely there's a way that they can make it a bit more comfortable for you. I mean, yeah, it was a it was a mess, but at the same time, it's not an easy task to do. You um, still did well. You still placed third. So you're t what you're telling me is the actual concept of the psychology body uh, of powerlifting isn't actually that intense in terms of where you think you're going to place because you can essentially pre-calculate that unless you have a massive injury. Is that what you're trying to say? I think you should just like care about your own training. Because I'm, you know, I'm asking you. Because for example, now I want to compete. So what would your sort of first thing you would tell me with, with regards to the mental side of things? Like, do it. My attitude going yeah, just do it. it. Just jump. Just go and do. The thing is, like, I, I'm not gonna like. This is the thing. I'm not gonna like. When I got invited to Wales, I was not like, oh, am I gonna do Wales? Am I gonna do well and stuff? Like, no, I, I just think think about it. I just trained like normal, and then I took a flight at some point. The thing is, like, yeah, at some point, like got to turn off that part of your brain like just shouts alarm 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 <laughs> just gotta yeah. that's what i mean like that's what's telling you in the lobby we're gonna get you today to buy a gbpf membership and then the moment you've bought a gbf membership i'm well, not sure i can afford it but very expensive thing is, cigars it's night. 35 pounds my man okay, how much is your cigar al more than that <laughs> and how long did that last about 45 minutes yes yeah, so <laughs> i like what you said though about just doing it because there's there's a there's a guy called john dan who is a professional jujitsu ju ju coach I'm into fighting as well and stuff. So I'm, and I've competed as well. So I sort of know that aspect of it. And he says there's a thing called the parable of a plank. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, and it's basically, uh, we've, a, we've heard this before. It's basically a story where a, uh, a stuntman went into a high school and he put a wooden plank down on the floor. It was like, you know, you know, the size of a wooden plank and he just walked across it. So then he put it across, uh, up on like the two buildings and he just walked across it. 
And the students were like amazed, like, oh, how can you do that? How were you able to just handle it? And the guy said, well, I've already walked across it on the floor. So, and so why should it be any different in the building? And I know that's a bit complicated, but what I'm trying to ask is, how can you compare that to like just doing it in the gym and just going out to the competition that's, and doing that's, it? That's a good question. That's what I'm. Tr- this is where I'm trying to go with that. Is, that was a bit unclear, question, yeah. but uh, it's just you just translate that performance so well from powerlifting into the gym, and you just do it every day. And I think there's such a psychology around competition because obviously competition is you know it's a very uneasy environment for some people. Some people don't like it. Some people can't handle the nerves. And you obviously seem to be quite adept in sort of handling yourself psychologically on competition day. So what advice would you give to them? To be fair, it was my worst work, but we'll get better at Euros hopefully in seven weeks. <laughs> but um, regarding this and psychology uh, and just like people that are thinking about getting into meets, the thing is um, powerlifting is more than just lifting weights. It's about practice. It's about practice in certain environments. Mm-hmm. It's about like in competition, you, do get to, you don't get to decide when you're going to squat to the next squat. No. You're being told when you're gonna squat your thing, then you're gonna squat it then. You're not gonna wait. Or else uh, you're just gonna like fuck people over. And the thing is like you won't actually get the chance to fuck people over because people will tell you, ah, fuck off. Yeah. The thing is, um the thing is uh, this, you are, in my opinion, a powerlifter if you compete. It is a competition sport. Are you a footballer if you never do a match? We had this I've said yeah, I've said this. Yeah, you can't call yourself that that until you've done it, I don't yeah. think. Exactly. The thing is, um, I don't know. I could uh, like. I don't want to be a gym hero. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm here to like. I'm here to compete. Mm. And I'm here like to beat people. And I'm here to rank as best as I can be. Mm. That's all that matters. And I would advise people who get want to get started in piloting just to get started, yeah. because <sighs> that's experience. Like, like uh, none of Alex's squad will count in competition. Hmm. Sorry, I missed none, that. Of, none of your squats will count in competition because you squat high. And then in competition, you get told off. And then you get the experience of, oh, I need to squat lower. Yeah, I, yeah. So, I, I had that. When I was competing in uh, in grappling, I was like, it was, I, I lost. And I it gives you pointers to what you need to work on. And I think you don't get that same sort of uh, vision yeah. or you don't get that same sort of pointer if you don't compete. You know, if you're training all the time and then you like fail a PR mm-hmm. or like a one or max attempt, for example, and you're like, oh, I, you put it down to these sort of things. Oh, you know, I did this wrong. I'm not too familiar with the squat technique. So, you know, I'm not I'm not going to try and use that terminology. But I think if you fail that, you can sort of blame it on other things. But then if you go to a competition and then you get judge feedback or professional feedback, you can sort of take that and then you know what to improve on. It's the same with bodybuilding, you know. They give judge feedback to the, the athletes and then they go back and then they retrain Mm. And then they just do that again. So I think it is in very important to compete in powerlifting because you know where you're going to go wrong and what you're doing wrong. It is extremely important also from a skill perspective. Competing is really a skill. Yeah. Like I know a lot of people, like the guy actually I beat at Junior Nationals, uh, Max Gua, shout out to you, Max. I love you. <laughs> but Max, uh, the thing with Max is that uh, at least at 74, he's going up to 83. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that will make this better, but maybe the cuts or something. He mentioned it was the cut, but basically Max had an amazing training total. He was looking extremely good for national. I think his total was even like, it's quite close to mine. Mm-hmm. But the thing is like on the day I would lift it in by 57.5 kilos. And it's because all of his numbers plummeted on the day. And is just uh, being able to like time your peak, being able like so that you're strong on the day, mm. being able to make the right decisions on the day when it comes to attempts, being able to deal with your cuts because like obviously I'm cutting weight to get to my weight class. Yeah, cutting weight isn't fun. No, it never it's, is. It's not. Uh, it never is to be fair, but it's necessary. It's like I, I walk around like right now this morning I woke up at like seventy six point four. Something like this, and I compete under 74. Yeah, for uh, now. I mean, for the foreseeable future, I don't see myself going up, to be you honest. No. I thought you were going to. You told me you were going to. Uh, maybe in the future, but not now. Absolutely not now. You want to excel in, in this kind I of think way. I can, yeah. So, like, I'm still progressing. I'm still making gains. I don't see, and the cuts never really affects me in competition. Yeah. So, so let's talk on. about the psychology of, com- of com- uh, competition day. 
obviously you've got a lot of things going through your head, adrenaline, excitement, you know, all that work you've put in leading up to the contest. What sort of things go through your head? What do you think about? So say now if I was to say, right, you've got 10, well, I don't know how it works, but you've got 10 minutes, you've been called on. What are you thinking? Is there like as in a process? Out. So you know, if I say, oh, you got your squat in your, your, your attempt in 10 minutes or five minutes or a minute, what, what, what goes through your head before you get under the bar or go and get under the bench? I try not to hype myself up too much because that can lead to just issues. I try to take every attempt by attempt. I'm not, when I do my first attempt, just I'm not, be present then. yeah, I'm not thinking about my third attempt when I do my first. Mm, I'll yeah. do my first, I'll just move it as well as I can. I'll do my second, I'll just move it as well as I can. I'll just do, and I'll just do my third and as well as I can. Like I try to take things one by one because I've noticed that like overstimulation and having a lot of fuzz in my head really fucks me up. Mm. So like I try like not to think about it. Easier said than done though. Well, yeah, I was going to say that, 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 that seems like a, such an ideal scenario. <laughs> no, no, but like ideally you want to like, again, it's like squatting and like squat volume. You, you want to get to the ideal but at the same time you need like things don't always go to plan and you just account for them. Yeah, but in the thought, the thought process as well, like yeah. I, I can't imagine, you know, the majority of people just being able to not think about their third attempt and then on their first. I mean, it must be a learned skill. Surely. I think that's what makes people elite and people who can't reach that sort of level though. Because, you know, you can prepare as much as you can physically, but sometimes the psycho- the psychological factors can weigh you down more than an actual injury. Because in, you know, you can, it's not overcome an injury, but you can sort of like, you've done this before and we spoke on a Zoom call this, earlier this week and you were, I, I was voicing my concerns about injury. And, and you were, doesn't get injured. And you were saying injured. like some, some people think their back hurts when in reality it doesn't, but they're just painting this picture in their mind of their back hurting, but it's not. So I think your psychological know, profile like, can trump that a lot. It, it, it kind of hurts. It's more like you're not harmed. Like you don't have physical like elements, you know what I mean? Mm. It's not like your back may be hurting. Like I had this once where I was stuck to a bed for like two days, but then I was back to training two days later. The thing is like a lot of times it's a lot of like, just like pain is not the same as being injured. And uh, there are ways to get around, but it's more like staying calm in that situation. Yeah. Not panic. But no, yeah. Um, regarding this and competing, I think it's experience. I think people, that's why people need to compete more. The pe- okay, I will say this. I think the people that load 35 kilos on the bar of the last attempt on squats have three times the balls of people that squat 200 and say they're not strong enough to compete. Yeah. So like three then. Yeah. You don't squat 200 though. But if, I, if I did though, but I'm that guy who thinks he just I, can't do it. A depth though? Adept. We'll find out later. Honestly, I hate you, bro. Don't even, don't even. Why do you know why, Alice? It's because it's because he's calling you out, and you're you're being forced yeah. to accept this from a world level guy. We'll have footage if your squats are high. Yeah, we're actually filming a session as well, so I'm going to be further roasted on camera. In yeah. but I think competition does is the best form of discipline as well. You know, you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it sends you onto like another level of motivation. Yeah. I think if you competed, I think your mindset I would change so much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so fat and I'd probably actually make gains because I just feel like there's no, there's, there are no stakes. The stakes are not high. Yeah, you're not competing against someone specific. Oh, I thought you meant food stakes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I thought you meant actual yeah. beef. Yeah. Alex, you forget the last deadlift. I'm giving you my crispy chicken. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say what? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, so- no, I'm just saying, like, if there's, no, if there's no pressure on, and I can go in the gym and squat 140 to half reps and not really care because what's the point? But, you know, I feel like when the stakes are higher and you're right, you're competing, you've got a purpose. And I don't even know, maybe when I come out the other end of competition, I'll have a completely different view in it, and then I'll be more focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't be eager whiskey for anymore. more. I, find, I, I think. won't smoke cigars. You're anymore. stuffing indifferently from the moment on your first attempt on squad, you get three red lights, and you're like, "Oh, yeah, because what if I fail? everything I've done is wrong?" What if you I fail attempt that? one and two? Which what am I going to do? At this point, I would. I'd probably fail all of my squad attempts if I competed next week. Uh, you know what would happen then? You know, if I failed attempt one and two, am I just supposed to get under the bar on my third attempt, having still doing my opener? And I just get under there and just go, oh, this is fine. Let me just focus on this. Or I think, right, if I fail this, I basically place last. I actually almost had a situation like this once. It was last year. I was competing to get qualified for 
um, for a um, uh, 2021 national. And I was trying to get, I was qualifying and I almost bombed out. Bombing out is when you, um, you cannot complete uh, all three attempts of one lift. It's like three strikes and you're out. Sort of thing in baseball. No, you can't complete any, you mean? Yeah, any of the three attempts of one lift. That means you can't put up a total. Oh, okay. If you can't put up a total, how are we supposed oh, so to? If you, so you so you're can't, out you can't immediately. just a total from two lifts, that, two, two, uh, ex, uh, two movements. It's just, you have to at least get something on the board for each. Yeah. The thing if you is if you get only one out of like out of three for all three, you're still qualified. If you did do a whole meet and it's like six for six at this point and you get none of your deadlifts, it's like fuck off. It's just it's all or nothing basically. Exactly. Yeah, that's the, the thing. thing is, oh, I'm sorry, you but basically I had an experience where my first attempt was two sixty, the way it was a bit too heavy for an opener at that time. But uh should have opened at two fifty. But basically, um I had two sixty. I did it the first time. However, it was uh, when COVID was still a thing, you know, and uh, it's fake news now. And the thing is, uh, we didn't have handlers. Handlers are people that are in the back while you warm up and load your weights that do everything for you. One of the things they do on the lift is put baby powder on your legs. Okay. And baby powder on the legs is, uh, it's not chalk. It's the reverse of chalk. It makes everything slippery. And someone handed me the bottle and I touched it with my own hands right before going for the lift and I started feeling my left hand go and I just dropped it at the top for like at some point I had to like re like recollect myself I can't just go like oh my gosh how am I gonna hold on to my lift I just went calmly I just washed my hands I just reapplied chalk uh it was still hot I it was still hard to hold on to but I held on to it at the top because I was yeah. like if I don't hold on to it now like it's never it's now or never yeah and I qualified. And uh, it's like at this point, you just gotta like, you gotta do it. Like can't like afford to just like be like. <laughs> a bitch. <laughs> can't afford to be a bitch, but like there's also also people. Don't get too inside your head and just, just, just. That's what, I mean, there are also like a kind of people that like just make it out as if it's not a big deal. Mm. It is a big deal. For you, it is. You traveled all the way here. Like you trained, you, that you trained much. for it, and everyone that's gone through a cut and a peak will tell you, but it's not fun. Mm. I don't know what a cut is like. Buzz in. I've I've done one. That's it. I, I okay. I, I, maybe I'll talk about the cut because it's not a conventional cut. No, uh, I just want to say something about competition, just because we're on the point there. I think competition is great because it teaches you more about yourself than you'll ever find out through anything else. Mm. I think that's what I've learned. Like it really teaches you who you are because when you face adversity and you, or you face like a, a tough situation, you start to unravel parts of yourself. You didn't think you had, or you yeah, but competition like also goes beyond just a fight competition or a pole competition. Everything you do is a competition with somebody else. So yes. just generally in life, when you're in a sanctioned competition, like powerlifting, fighting, boxing, yeah. uh, bodybuilding, you go oh, yeah. through hard times and it really, really picks think, stuff out of yourself. this is the next, it has to be the next step for me. I think you because should. My, my willpower is crap. I talk about discipline, but I have none. And I think, I think being coached by you as well, because we can talk about that, because I think you should coach. You know, you've shot on so many coaches in this episode, so we might as well get you to, to, to sit at the top on the pedestal. I'm joking, I'm joking. But, no, uh, I should but, not be at the, at the pedestal yet. I've not made a name for no, myself. No, but, yeah, but see, this is the thing. That's right, I like that. Like this a lot. the thing. We were speaking to a bodybuilder, and he was like, what, is he like one of the top dogs in he Wales? He was a Welsh physique champion. Um, shout out Cam Physique Wales. Cam, Cam Wales, yeah. And uh, he, he was saying he hasn't accomplished anything. You know, he was so humble in his mindset. I was like, I was, I was training in kicks, and uh, he spotted me for a leg set. And we got to speaking afterwards and I was speaking to him and it was very good, very insightful conversation. And then he was, I was like saying, oh, look, you know, he, he knew we had recent the podcast, I think. I think he'd seen, you know, like one of our clips before. Yeah. I followed him on Instagram, you know, I messaged him saying like, nice to have a chat with you. And I asked him to get on the podcast and in person and this was, and he said, oh, I haven't accomplished anything yet. I was like, well, you're in amazing shape. You're a good person. You're very inspiring. And you're already a champion in what you've set out to achieve. And obviously he's got bigger goals than that. But he was very modest and that's what I like. Um, about, about you, your mindset is never you're never ticked. You're never ticking boxes off. You're just always focusing on something. I think that's what keeps you ahead of the curve in competition. It's more like it's a bit like that. Like I'm not like satisfied with what I've accomplished yet. 
So what are your overall goals? If I, if you had yeah, to boil it down, what would, what would you what do? What do you want? What do you want from this? So 2020, I will only talk about 2023. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Talk about, uh, mm-hmm. I don't like focusing on like granular goals. Yeah. Because okay. like I never thought I'd be like, I mean, I aim maybe at some point to be British champion, but I never thought I'd get that. Or like, I thought I would like honestly stop at 100 squats max. Like, but then well, we can talk about this later, but I think like uh, people's standards when it comes to strength are just like completely skewed and uh, they tend to call out drugs when generally like, you know, it's not drugs, it's just more talented than you. Yeah, just that's what Matthew harder. says. Every time someone's in better shape than him, he's like, oh, he's, he, you think, do you think he's on steroids? I'm just like, don't even worry. Even if he is, assume he's not. Uh, I don't do that all the time. Uh, I have done it before, but yeah, no. We, we, I think everyone's, everyone's guilty. guilty. We'll talk about this later, but basically for 2023, my goals are hopefully becoming open champion mm. in Britain. What's the difference in the open and is it the overall? A, yeah, 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 age. As of right now, I am within the people running, I am second. In the UK, uh, for the Open, I am like the first junior in the UK. But junior, I how old is junior? Twenty five and under. Twenty three. Twenty three. Yep. Okay. And you are twenty one. Uh, no, I'm twenty three. Oh, are you? Yep. Next yeah. year, I'm in the Open. I know he's small, but uh, he's, he's he's a big boy. Anyway, uh, um, back to your. I like your go, uh, getting so, into the competition thing here. Though we've uh, talked a lot about that. To be fair, I love competition. It's I only done uh, like yeah. ten this competitions. Is my, this is the next I day. love competing. You know, once someone said, "Oh yeah, the best part is when you're loading for someone and like you're helping them." It's, no, no, no. The best part is on the platform. I can imagine. All eyes on you. Even even organizing the competition. Remember when we did the varsity for KCL Barbell? Um, I I loved the whole environment. I loved emceeing a bit. I mean, I was I emceed for weightlifting, which I know next to nothing about, but it was still fun, you know? And I just loved the whole thing of trying to hype people up and get people sort of calm down. The only thing that I that was uh, sort of my weakness there is that I hadn't competed myself, so I was just trying absolute shit to everyone. <laughs> I was like, no, it's okay, it'll be fine. I didn't know if it would be fine. <laughs> so should we get, we get back on to your goals? So you are currently... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you're yeah. currently so, junior. So next uh, year. Next year, uh, next year is next open. Year is next year, open champion. I don't know if I'll be able to do that, but my goal next year will be to be the first ever lifter to total 10 times body weight in the UK. Shit. <laughs> 10 times. That's insane. So 700 kilo. 740. Oh, okay. I think I have 700 in me right now. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. It's like, I think I have the potential to be able to do 740. Yeah, I think at depth, I've probably got a good 250 in me. I think I've got... And ten, <laughs> total. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, not. No. I mean, we'll see your total soon. We will doing singles in it. Is it? Yeah, we're doing singles, but you're not maxing out. But we'll see some kind of total because you're either gonna do one bench, or one squat, one bench, and one deadlift. And by the way, this is all gonna be filmed, so we you you'll be able to see this video on YouTube. Link in the bio. <laughs> oh, it, it will be. Link if you want to see me die. Um, for all my haters out there, today's a good day for you. We got kidnapped by a pal of her and now now like subjected to torture. <laughs> Take me yeah. to your red room sort of, uh, sort of vibes. IR or ER? <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, like... 10 times body weight though. That's a good goal. I, I like to do that. We'll see. We'll see if it happens, but I like to do that. Um, so you're not looking too far. You're just looking next year then. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Thank so you. what you wanna you wanna move out of junior completely? I mean, I'm not junior anymore. Period. Next year. It's 25. It's by, though, right? it's by age. 23. 23. Is it 23? I thought it was under 25. No, 23. The world's yeah. is under 25. Hmm? Is it? Uh, some other sports is 25, but ah. ours is 23. See, I, I mean, know nothing about this. So. I mean, to be fair, even if I was like, even if I was still junior, I would still go open. Yeah, you told you telling me about going to do that last year anyway. You wanted, you were thinking about it. I was thinking about it because not gonna lie, it looked fun. Open looked more fun than juniors. To be yeah. fair, just so wait, of, you're going ahead. To, uh, would you go head to head with uh, if you won a worlds? You go head to head with Atwood then. Yep. Who is Atwood? Taylor Atwood. Taylor Atwood is like the best powerlifter period on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And he's a, in my way past. Yeah, yeah. How old I mean, is he? He, he? Oh, he's like, like thirty something. Right? Oh, he's not 30, like young. Thirty-five. No, it's open, so they but go like, right up to. The forms. thing is, like powerlifting is the kind of sport you can continue doing for a while, and he's just one of these guys that has emerging genetics has been working in powerlifting for like over 10 years. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, I think like over 10 years. I don't know how he has time for it though, because he's a consultant at IBM, right? He's a, he's a, he's a senior consultant at IBM. And Built different, just mindset. And he has like a, an MBA for Columbia. 
And he has he has like the the sickest hair haircut. Honestly, have you seen? You don't know what this guy looks like. No, get him up as a photo. Up, you Do you think he smokes cigars? Do you see, like he has time for that? I don't know if oh, you've seen it. Have you seen a uh, mini Tom Cruise from uh, Family Guy? Uh, yes. That's him. That's him. <laughs> let me let me let me get this guy up. Take a look. I feel like I should know who this is if he's like one of the not necessarily one of the best. I mean, if, if, you you fall, if I do seven forty next year, I'll be quite up there among seventy fours. What's his total? Uh, at Worlds he's done seven ninety, and out of Worlds in a national competition, he's done once eight thirty eight point five. Oh, yeah, that's insane. I'm like, I'm currently watching. I always this. find it really impressive because obviously I'm like. So this is like yeah. an outlier. Shella Atwood is compared to everyone in this weight class an outlier. I know. It's basically like sure fire. You're not going to win if you're competing. There is like a 100 kilo gap between him and everyone. That's a lot. Like it's not just a lot. That's unprecedented. Like, yeah. There is no one. No one. No one in the 83. No one in the 66s. No one in any men's weight classes. That just mugs as much as him. Mugs. I love that term. Uh, um, there's going to be a lot of people want, uh, watching this who are going to wonder, what does this guy eat? What, 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 how do you fuel your body for powerlifting? You know, because obviously you're creating such an excessive demand in your body due to your high load in lifting. So besides steak and noodles and ham on ham and toast, what do you eat? Or parma ham, for the technical term. I, I use serrano. It's less fats. But uh, basically what I eat is... Um, uh, generally a lot of carbs. I think I'm between 375 grams and 400 grams of carbs a day. That sounds good. That's nice. I can I can work with that. And uh, I eat about like 170 grams, 180 grams of protein because mm. uh, you need protein. Uh, and uh, about 70 grams of fats, maybe 70 to 80 grams of fats. Mm. And uh, honestly, like I'm pretty pleased. Uh, so with- do all the guys doing fasted cardio to get their weight down? This guy eats nearly 400 grams of carbs and he's 74 kilos. So yep. SPD may be the way forward for everyone. I mean, uh, it's like, it's just um, my body sits at 76, 76.5. Like, it's so funny because, you know, I was having a conversation with uh, other friends on the UCR group chat and over 70 falls there. And I was like, guys, I'm quite heavy. I'm like 77.4 right now. That was like two weeks ago. and uh, I haven't been 77.4 since I was six. I think I was just bloated. Or <laughs> I think I was just bloated or something. And the thing is, like, they replied, oh, yeah, I'm heavy, too. I'm, like, 82. <laughs> that's that's cool. Like, 83. 83 is a weight class above, by the way. I was just, like... Wait, they're competing in under 74, but they're 83. Yeah. They might as like, well just move up at that just, point. Like, literally, I was just, like, guys, like, you're not, like... Like, just stay if you think you can beat me, like... But like I, I if think... you can't beat me and you're 84 and 83 in the off-season... What the fuck are you doing I just, here? I just, yeah. I think I'm an 83 because I'm quite lean actually. It's just a bit of water. No, you should, not, you, should not be an 83. How much do you weigh now, Al? <laughs> if it's triple digits, just don't say anything. Okay, so okay, next yeah. <laughs> No, I think like, in all honesty, I think you should just say at 105. I'm, I'm actually, I would actually, if I could beat it tomorrow, I'd be 120. The thing is, when I, I find that when you, when you stick to I'm your not natural. not much, I mean 107.5, something like that. I don't know, you like you I weigh, should, uh, in my opinion, you should stay at 105. Yeah. I, I have no intention of going to 120. When you, stick, even... when you stick to your natural sort of weight, I, sort, I of, think sort I of limit, you yeah. perform a lot better. If, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. if you have to really deplete yourself to perform, this, obviously, you know, you see like the UFC and stuff, they cut weight a lot. They cut like 20 pounds, 10 kilo a week. Yeah, you can't do that in IPF. No. Yeah, For I... this, it seems a lot different. And I think that if you cut weight, I think that'd go against you in, in weightlifting. Oh, oh, if it was set up the same way they set it up in uh, the UFC, mm. I'd maybe do it. Problem is you can't do that in a two-hour weigh-in. So they weigh you two hours before you yeah. compete. What are, what do they weigh you in? Hmm? What do you wear when you weigh in? Are you wearing like shorts or is it like your kit or? No, you just wear like underwear in it. Oh, so it's, it's like that's our weigh-in. Yeah, f- yeah it's just a fight. normal weigh-in. It's like there is no like conference. Like it's just generally it's <laughs> just a, it's just two old dudes. <laughs> nice. It's just two old dudes uh, with a scale in a room, and uh, you just weigh yourself, I guess. We have a table to like note your name and shit, but like that's it. And uh, no, you just weigh yourself. And uh, then from that moment, you have like two hours to replenish, warm up. Yeah. So do you have a procedure on competition day? So you no. say you say you weigh in at eight. What's your, what do you do after that? You just loading up on carbs? Uh, it's not the first thing I do. Uh, I think hydration is more important in that situation 
mm. and uh, just comes. Because mind yourself, I've cut weight to get to 73 point something. So you're dehydrated. I'm heavily dehydrated. Mm. Like, like at Worlds, we, I had to wait like an extra hour and I was literally like fucking fuming. I was just like, man, I just want to fucking drink. Like yeah. my, my head hurts. Yeah. Disorientated. Yeah. It's really fucking hard for me to sit down to. So I was just like losing water. <laughs> so uh, something I have to deal with better in the future. But basically after I've weighed in, the first thing I do is I eat a tiny bit just to accommodate my stomach a bit. And then I drink three liters of uh, water with a saline solution. Because if you just drink the water, you will just piss it out. Yeah. Because there is no sodium, no potassium, no magnesium in it. So no electrolytes. So basically, if you're in a state of dehydration and you just drink water, you're doing it wrong. You need uh, some salt. Sometimes I add salt to my water. Yes. Yeah, so, well, salt helps water retention. Exactly. Typically. So I remember I was, was actually my best refeed of all time. I drank three liters of water and did not piss a drop. And, yeah. I felt, and I did not feel bloated. I felt actually good. The, actually, the a national, I kind of fucked up my refeed. I was really bloated. And... Uh, Tell me about this. Yeah, I threw up before my first good. Yeah. You must lose loads of uh, nutrients that way. You must have felt crap. Did you feel crap or did you just get into it and just do well? Oh, I just got into it. I, I just, at some point, I was just like... I was very calm about it. I just told my coach, oh, by the way, Norman, uh, I'm going to puke. He was like, okay, cool, I'll come with. And then I just went, I puked a little, and then I was like, I feel better. He was like, cool, let's go. So your next your next competition is the Europeans. Yeah. Are, are you going to do anything differently from the Worlds to the Europeans? Like, yep. Have you learned anything that you're going to apply? I'm going to come there earlier. In the week? Yep. So the competition is when? Sunday? So, yeah. Mine is on Sunday. My weigh-in is at, as of right now, because we might ch- change the dates, because final nominations will come. But my date is 27th of November, so it's a Sunday, and my weigh-in is at 4 p.m. Okay. And you're competing at 6 p.m. 6. Did what country is this in? Poland. Okay. All right, okay. So I'll come earlier uh, to chill and probably get a trace training session in the warm-up room to get also used to the warm-up room because it was really weird in Turkey when you came in and you see the warm-up room and it's like fucking chaos. And like it's stress on you. You just go like, okay, yeah, it's gonna go well. But yeah, well, in an ideal world, you just have a room by yourself. <laughs> no, like in an ideal world, you just uh, yeah. I mean, you just uh, uh, yeah, you just shrug it off and go for it. Do you get nervous at all for competing? Hmm? Do you get nerves? Yes, I get them, but I try not to think about it. A lot of things I try not to think about it. Yeah, I think that is. I think your nerves will cool off after a certain amount of competitions. Naturally, I'm fascinated with you. I need obviously I can't really talk about it because I haven't competed. But I can just imagine me being a wreck. Like, how how am I supposed to navigate this whole process? I just feel like I would think about my third attempt on deadlift before I've squatted. The thing is, like in the internationals, you have coaches thinking for you. Yeah, I suppose they just hold your hand through the whole. Ideally, you're just like executing it. That's it. Yeah, so they basically choose your attempt. The thing is, you. basically, when I saw my both, both my handlers, my handlers were Martin and Jason. Uh, I love you guys if you see me. <laughs> but uh, shout out to these guys because they're amazing. They placed me third. They're the ones who did the work. Mm. Um, the thing is, uh, I told them, I don't give a shit what's on the bar. Just load it. I'll lift it. Yeah. The thing is, ideally, you want to be put in a situation where you just execute Arguing yeah. with the coach. It's almost like a binary thing. Like, there's no emotion. It's just it, it should be. Yeah. It should be. Well, it's all numbers, so why shouldn't your decision making be binary too? Exactly. No, I'm just saying like, it seems impossible that you can get to that point. I mean, are there, do you think you're well, better it's than just like others? It's just like relinquishing control because you having control makes things worse. So the, from the standpoint, you know making things worse, you, you deciding making, will yeah. make things worse. Well, it's because you doubt yourself. No, because you doubt yourself. Because you get I'm, excited I, as well. You must where well, you get excited yeah, so if, it, if just, it goes up, you're like, oh, it's not right. just that. I don't want to make decisions on the day. I want to be stress free. Yeah, just do. Yeah, yeah, you deal with it. There you go. There are two, like two people decide for all of you, and they're generally in a better position mentally to make decisions than you are, mm-hmm. because you might want to push harder than you want than you can, mm-hmm. and that like they're the ones seeing you lift. You don't see yourself lift. So from that standpoint, they're the ones that make the better decision. And in my opinion, it's like. 
it's still better for them to make the decisions because it's like, how to say this? Um, like, let's see this. They're the ones who have to find a world. Would you rather argue with them, spend energy, time, stress, arguing with them? What, even if they're, and they're the ones who are in command of the final decision. Mm. And uh, even like you spent all that time, like just like wasting your time. Getting stressed as well. Getting stressed. So it's like you've basically wasted all that time just like arguing when you actually haven't changed the outcome rather than just, you know, like just um, shut your mouth, just tell them, <laughs> just do whatever. I don't give a shit. Yeah. They load it. You're getting me really inspired now. I want. I've got. I've got to compete. If I don't compete next year, then I'm, I might as well just. Cancel. Oh, you're gonna. Again, I am not leaving today until you're getting your GBPF membership. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, you first then. You're. If you get it, you'll be like, man, I spent thirty five pounds. I need to make them useful. Yeah. Well, I don't know Alex buys cigars, so I don't know whether that mindset uh, applies. Boost, here. Cigars boost testosterone. It's like the best thing you can do. It's like so anabolic. Or just lift heavy weights. Wait, wait, wait. What is about boosting testosterone? What? I don't know. I mean, Andrew Tate said cigars boost testosterone. That's so working out? Be true, working right? out? No, smoking cigars. Just smoke cigars. It's simple. I don't know what, what the confusion is. Smoke cigars, you get strong. Or just compete and lift clean, eat uh, clean. So like, do you think that people should do... Being an insult will make, you, uh, will make your testosterone like go through a roof and... Could do. Do you think people should... Do an SPD or train in a powerlifting cell just to get in shape, or do you think they should train it just for competition purposes? Um, so, like I say, if, if I said to you, "Look, I want to become dense and strong, but I don't want to compete," or do you think they should do it just uh, for the competition purpose? Uh, I'm going to give more of a nuanced answer than you might expect. Okay, interesting. I think powerlifting can be generally useful for health because, like. It's a very, it's actually the second lowest, uh, I think I told you about on the call, it's the second yeah. lowest injury <laughs> rates. Anyone, the one above only being bodybuilding. Mm. Sorry, you're slightly <laughs> more injury run uh, today. But um, the thing is, um, you don't have impact on the joint. Mm. You also tend to develop um, generally like your bone density increases. Because not gonna lie, my skeleton is not the same from when I was squatting 150 from when I squatted 250 plus now. Mm. My skeleton has literally gotten like thicker. It's like like the body just adapts to the demands yeah, over yeah. time. And it's like like I'm not gonna lie, that can be quite useful, especially when you get old. So I've like just denser bones. Also having more muscle mass will help because uh generally what you tend to lose muscle mm. uh as you age. And uh, having NTRT and having more muscle in general <laughs> yeah. helps prevent yeah. that, or like at least like reduce the damage. However, on the other end, there are all the reasons why I would say it's not the best. Uh, generally, uh, cardiovascular health is a good indicator of uh, lifespan, mm. but cardiovascular activity does powerlifting have. Yeah, there's a big stereotype in powerlifting that uh, they t just sit down for about four hours in between sets. Oh, it, you, it, you know, you must it, have seen the memes online. It, where, is, it is true. It is true. But then there's obviously a specific reason behind that. But like a lot of the stigmas these days are like, oh, you know, if you lift heavyweights, you're going to have a bad back. You're going to have bad knees. You oh, know, you're going to have know, a fucking strong knees and back. You know, people honest. who are out of shape, they say this. I don't get it. They say this to us. They're like, oh, why do you go to the gym and lift heavyweights? You're just yeah. going to so, hurt your back. So do you think then, I mean... I mean, you kind of answered this earlier. Do you think SPD would be better just generally for people then? If you just did the power lift, because I've always said this, and it doesn't matter about competition. And I don't, I, I, I could, I could never agree with the notion that you should only do a power lifting style program if you want to compete. I don't think you need to do that. I think you should compete if you're training in power lifting fashion, and you can jump in. I know you want to, uh, but yeah. Let me. I just think personally, I've learned a lot since I started power lifting. I've understood. Uh, just training it in that way and doing actually squatting. A lot of people just say, I don't want to squat because it hurts and it's hard. So I'm going to leg press in 10 plates instead. I mean... That doesn't sit well with me, I don't think. No. No. What are your thoughts on that? People just not squatting because they think it's dangerous in any way. They just do leg press instead. Maybe they could squat deeper if they weren't like... You don't need to do a powerlifting depth squat because in powerlifting, you don't get extra 100 points for squatting lower than you need to. Yeah, 
you see Matthew, he's got a really nice deep squat, but deeper than it would need to be in competition. Uh, I can't go below like no. my volating depth. I yeah. li- physically cannot, which is useful for my sport, which is not as useful for mobility and joint health, I guess. Although like it's very like just a like it's a very restrictive restrictive way of thinking about it, but especially when it comes to injuries and stuff. But I would say maybe like just the overall movement, you know, like a good deep pack squat will feel really good and will build more muscle than a powerlifting competition squats. Mm. Just because you're under more range of motion. And also because uh you can push it harder. Like you can push a hack squat way harder than you can. Yeah. Like, like okay, maybe I'm the exception because I am someone who is like extremely well built for squats. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So obviously I can push a set of squat way harder than most individuals. So that's why I have more squats in my program than most people. And um and yeah. But however, I do not represent most people in that scenario. Like most people are generally not that well like configured to squat. And uh, I would say, I'm, I'm not saying you should avoid squatting. I think you should have variety of movement. Mm. That is quite healthy to have variety of movement. However, when you powerlift, you focus on specificity. And if you focus on specificity, therefore, there are some, uh, like you just try to stay healthy, as healthy as you can, but like going with specificity all the way is generally not, um, going the same direction as like long-term health. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of discussion around this. I just want to ask you a question. So you see a lot of people now who are new to the gym, you know, especially in commercial gyms like we've been to yeah. and trained in, they they sort of tend to neglect the the SBD. You know, they they think that they should be doing uh, very niche movements. So like, you know, like D-handle, lap pull-downs, where they're targeting like specific lateral fibers. Right where they haven't got those fibers to begin with in order to target them. So do you recommend for a beginner to just jump into an SPD due to the advantages you spoke of it? You know, and Alex, you spoke highly of these as well, building biomechanics, feeling good, feeling strong, proper technique. It also provides you with a good training program. So do you agree with that? Or do you think there should be a different start for beginners? Beginner in the gym or beginner powerlifter? In the gym. Just, so just com- com- complete newbie. Train, you yeah. don't need to squat bench deadlift. No? No, you don't need to. Like, what would you recommend there as like a good foundation to build, to lift weight? I mean, you don't need to, but at the same time, it's like, you should not restrict yourself to, it's like, you should not like go in with the mindset. I should not do that. Mm. Like you should, if you want to, like it is, there's a difference between, I don't want to squat because, you know, I just don't like it or I just don't enjoy it. There's a difference between that and oh, I'm scared of squatting. Mm. Like, yeah, I suppose it's just what 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 do you think when you think of these exercises? Like, if you're scared of something, I think that's all the more reason you should try to do it. Just like because you can't live your whole life with the fear of certain movements. We all know that guy. We all know that old fart who just like comes into the gym and just goes like, you know, like I don't really did this like 20 years ago. You know, when I was young, I hurt my back. Yeah. And it felt the same again. Like from that day, I've never, I stopped deadlifting. And I ask, oh, does your back not hurt anymore? I was like, it still hurts. So you can't blame it on that. You can't, like, like, it's basically like when, you know, when like, let's say this, uh, let's say you hurt your leg. So you decide to never walk again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What happens if you try to walk after 20 years of never using your legs? What the fuck happens? Yeah, it's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel good. You don't, you don't walk. Yeah, yeah. Probably going to feel like shit. So you just <laughs> yeah. avoid it. And that's exactly what these guys have done. They're in pain. And the thing is, like, bro, like, it's been 10, 20 years. Your tissue have had the time to, like, heal. Mm. Your tissues are fine. You're just, like, you're just scared. And that's, that's the fear is creating a signal of pain. That's why I mean injuries and yeah. pain are not exactly the same. We can't like just put them together. And in that sense, um, if you're scared of squatting because you're scared of uh, fucking yourself up, that's not good enough of a reason to me. I think people are scared of the, or they don't like the sort of intensity that comes with it. It's hard. I think you, look, Squats I think are hard. The reason I like it so much isn't necessarily because I think you could just do SVD and be fine. I think, you know, all the accessories and all the other movements are, are fantastic and I always do them. 
However, I think if nothing else, just do it for discipline. Do it because it's hard. Do it, just just do that instead of going and oh, doing yeah. like a couple five reps on a leg press because you know you can stop. And One easy. of my favorite things, I asked my coach if I can do that. Like, I'll just ask him, yeah, just put in the program, you know, just put it in. Because it always works. It always is like, it's actually a goal I love pushing. It's like a hard set of eight. Like my max is like two twelve point five for a set of eight. Yeah. Two twelve point five for eight. Yeah, that's gonna that be sixteen for me. That's hard. It's gonna be death for me. Like I just uh, and then I'm now I just want to push to twenty or more. Mm. I'm just like yeah, put in the program. And you put it in the program. Like I have like a deload week this week. Whew. <laughs> but, so it's only 195 for two by eight but then as the, as the weeks progress <laughs> oh my <laughs> god <laughs> just only 190 yeah. nah, but if you know. literally if you walk into a commercial gym you will not see i've only think i've only ever seen someone squat over 200 once in a commercial gym you will not see that kind of weight anywhere so I mean, when you mention this to me i'm like so we went huh? to pure gym I mean, and there were people like looking at you oh uh, yeah, yeah. I, I squatted 227 for four in the pure gym and everyone was like what no, but that's the thing. Like people, they they probably they are not programmed in a way to think this that a man of your size can bro, squat that much. Bro, this is the thing. Why? Okay, you know there is in KCL like King's College London where they have like these gyms. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah they do those yeah. gyms. Those <laughs> I don't know gyms. And it's like <laughs> no one squats two twenty there. Yeah, Alex, do you want to say why they don't squat two twenty there? Well, it's it's almost impossible to fit the weight in the bar to start with. Like the, the they have bumpers, right? The oh, twenty five kilo bumper bumpers place. are about this thick, and I've seen a video of you doing that. Do you still have that video? You don't have to show it now. But I, I have like it. I mean I have like a I don't think I have it anymore, but I have like a two twelve point five pause double yeah. that ended up being RP ten. Yeah, and by the way, the, the 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 bars are probably thinner than the bar of this of this. Mic I don't even think they're thinner. I think they're just shits. Yeah, but honestly, the whip. Right when you come back up, you're like shaking because it just it just wobbles. It, it, it just wobbles. wobbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so hard to control, and uh, it's okay if you're like a weightlifter, I guess, because you use the momentum of the bar. Although I talked to a weightlifting coach of uh, weightlifting uh, of um, uh, KCR weightlifting, and he said, "Yeah, no, like uh, it's uh, it's still hard. Like even for like Olympic weightlifters that use the whip, how about it? I just hit the arm, but basically." Um, it's um, uh, it's it whips so hard you actually can't get any shit done. And the thing is, yeah, you it's hard to stay tight as well because you're constantly being forced out of position. I think that's, yeah. that's how I feel. The thing is, you know, like there is um, we talked about like mental and stuff, but that you know, there are certain mental aspects to powerlifting. Like you need to be someone who is like a creature of habit. You need to be someone who likes numbers. Someone who is generally like you have a lot of engineers in powerlifting. There is a reason for that. There is like a bias also like just towards this discipline. You know what I mean? You tend to do that discipline because your mind just works in a certain way. And it's like, it's a very repetitive sport. You have people that could be very strong, but that can't stick with it because it's like so repetitive. And so like, do that for years. Mm. Uh, I am very like that. So that's why I also have stuck with sports. That's why I love the sports, et cetera. Uh, people that are also more mentally inclined to just, you know, jump. Like, because when you have thrown under the bar, it's like there's a difference between thinking, oh, that could fuck me up, and the difference between, between thinking that and thinking, I get to fucking lift 300. I get to yeah, fucking lift yeah, it. Yeah, 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 that's true. Fucking lift it. So you think it takes a sort of different sort of person to compete at powerlifting level? Well, a, a good level in powerlifting. They have to be sort of... To, to perform at higher levels. Yeah. To stick with it. Because you need to stick with this sport. This kind of sport, you need to stick with it to become better at it. So... What do you think separates you from, I don't want to say like an average level, but what do you think makes you, not exceptional, but to compete at a high level, what sort of qualities about yourself do you think you have that allows you to compete at a world, <clears throat> European, <throat> British level? Um, I am psychotic sometimes about the way I prep for stuff, mm. but I'm still thinking about it extremely healthily. How so? Explain yourself. What do you mean by psychotic? Have uh, you not met this man? Well, no, I've not, <laughs> I've met him for about, for the amount of time we've been doing this. So, I mean, please, Alex can vow, do you have uh, stories about me or some shit like this? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. It's just just general behavior. Okay, no, like general behavior and stuff. It's like very regimented, very very routine. You sort of like just you plan something out and then you just do it. Yeah, There's no ever thought from from what I see from being your mate. 
characters. I mean, I don't ever see some. I mean, sometimes I have flaws and stuff, but it's like uh, I'm extremely routine based. I do the same things. I do the same things. I do it the exact same things. Like it's automatic. I don't even think about it. I think I've tracked on my fitness pal for the last two years with like very few exceptions, and I can count them almost on my fingers. Wow. The thing is, like, I don't, and the thing is, like, I don't even think about it. It's just so ingrained in my routine. It just happens. It's just part of my day. Yeah, I think that's the sort of common thing that we sort of establish with successful people is just that like robotic mindset. You know, just being able to execute just without thought, without wanting to do anything else, and without straying off your path. And I think that's a lot of that's a big thing people go wrong with these days. Is just you know, you know, it just it gets to a point where you're like, oh, do I want to do this? And then they have to think about it. It's like you know, if you ever woke up out of bed and thought, oh, do I want to go to the gym? Because like I don't, but you know, you meet people who are like that, and then like nine times out of ten, they don't end up going at all. So I think if you have to think about something, ninety percent of the time, you're not going to do it. No, that's not true. I think if you're disciplined, you'll do it. I get up every morning. and I don't want to go to the gym at six o'clock. In the no, morning. I'm not about pe- fasted with no coffee. I'm not about people are consi- people who consider like, oh, you know, should I? Oh, I'll go later. Do you know what I mean? Jocko said this as well. It's like his partner Echo. He he said he, he was oh, I'll go to the gym at five o'clock. When it was like early in the morning. Oh, right, just do it. Like just go. You just do it. Yeah. So, do you think that's the that is the key to success? Then I think it's the key is like doing it for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. The thing is, like Max Gua, the guy I beat at national, the guy who came second. I was actually, to be fair, he stopped training a bit because of COVID, but then came back quick. But I basically was like a hundred kilos under him when I started. But then I beat him by 57.5. So really you gained 157.5 kilos, really? I gained almost, like, almost 200 kilos on my total in these three years. But the thing is like, the thing is, uh, I mean, you, you need to keep at it. That's the thing. Yeah. You need to keep at it and just like keep pushing. And then you just like, someone start optimizing your stuff more. Uh, you start optimizing your diet, you start optimizing what you eat, you start optimizing your sleep. Something like that I kind of struggle on generally, like especially right now with my this. Yeah. But uh, you start taking care of your sleep. You start taking care of the way you recover. You start taking care of your stress because stress is something that it, that can be bad for your performance. You know, especially as a student. I mean, I, when, when I was a student too, I just found like, I mean, I, I just only just about had time to train. You know, I hardly had time to think about, you know, trying to optimize everything for my training because I just had so much to do. I mean, and I don't understand how people do it. This is when I was talking about Atwood, the Taylor Atwood, and how he manages to do his job and do that at the same time. It's probably not easy, but he does it anyway. Like, the thing is, yeah, like, it's in, so the, difficult. in the lead up to nationals, the five weeks when I was at six week out, Smark, something like this, mm. I was like battered by essays. I would go to the library every day until 4 a.m. I would come back home. Then I would sleep. I would wake up at 11. Then I would go to the gym. Then I would go to the library and the cycle. Again and again and again. It was for over a month. Just rinse and repeat constantly. Just yeah. go in and go in and go. Because the thing is, like, I'm not going to think like, oh my gosh, like so much work to do. Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm just like, okay, okay, sure. anyway, well, yeah. just think. Uh, about it. Just buy one k per day, and that's it. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. See, and a lot of people don't have patience nowadays. I've noticed. You know, we live in such a a fast society. You know, everyone's get instant gratification is so accessible these days. You I'm know. You know, not even like in terms of like a food way, like, you know, TikTok, Instagram, you can just go on Instagram so quick and look at something or you can just get so like taken away by like the nonstop scrolling and the never ending feed. And I think patience is a, obviously patience is a virtue, but it's something that all successful people need as well. And like you said, you you can relate this to powerlifting because you have had to be patient in your time of training and sort of have that switch and know when to go and when to pull back. This is the thing, right? Uh, My co- I said this on the other podcast, but I'll say it again. And I love you, Norman, for this quote, because this is an amazing quote. Norman is my coach. It's never a f- like if you actually put in the work, if you put in everything you have, if you do everything right, it's never a matter of if, it's always a matter of when. When. Oh, and I like that. You. There's a one line for you. Write that down. And uh, no, you need to make it so that. Like, I didn't know if I was going to beat Max. I didn't know if I was going to beat all these guys. Eventually, I caught up. Mm. And now it's like I'm battling against people whenever I thought I get to battle against. And my goal is just to keep pushing this as much as I can. 
uh, the highest level I can. So is that what motivates you then? Mm-hmm. The, it does, does that what motivates you? So when you, you know, when you wake up in the morning, what drives you? What, what is that driving force behind you that gets you out of bed and gets um, you training, gets you through those hard times? You know the meme of like, and I took that personally. Oh yeah, <laughs> that tends to be me. Really? Yeah. In what in what context? In the lead up to the 2022 national, the one I won. The thing is like, pe- most people were giving me the win. Um, but someone said it was really going to be a fight between me and Max mm. on a podcast. Uh, it was Jasper, if you're listening, Jasper. But Jasper, uh, someone, he basically said that it was going to be a fight between me and Max. And I listened to the extract of the podcast, the 10 minutes, I listened to it all week long. Yeah, so repeat. just in your mind. Yeah. And that's what, like, it's more discipline and like trying to get to the highest level I can. That disciplines me. But what motivates me when I'm like close to a meet, when I'm... Is the naysayers then, is it the people who may doubt the fact that maybe you won't win? Uh, bloodlust. I, I'll be the first to admit it. It's just, I just want to beat these guys. Yeah. I, I just I just want to be these guys. And in the competition scenario, and again, this isn't something that I'm familiar with. It's something that I aspire to have. I think that that's what I miss in. And I train with one one of my mates back at home. And he's not a powerlifter, but he's strong. And he's like, he trains hard, you know? Well, back in the day, he was a lot more aggressive. He's calmed down a bit now. But he would just always tell me, you know, Al, you, you haven't got that aggression in you. You haven't got that fight in you. You just get under the bar, you squat, come back up nice and slow. But you're not looking... When you look at the bar, you don't have that. You know, when I see, when I look in your eyes, you don't have that in you. It's Some, like it's almost like I'm missing that fire. You know, that real bloodlust, as you say. Something can set that off, though. You know, things it, can happen Alex, that can fat. give you that. Yeah, I, I keep shouting, "You're fat under the bar!" Like when we're going to train. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, I keep saying this is a joke. It's just so funny, but. I, I told Ant when I had some back pain, and he said it's because I've got the the physical body of a of a pregnant woman. Um, so, uh, so so basically, when you're <laughs> pregnant, right? Oh, here we go now. Science by now, not bad. No, there is, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. So basically, yeah. your belly protrudes. Problem is, in, that's a leverage issue, because you need to bring all that back. What do you use to bring all that back? Your back. Your back. So if you get a lower back pump, like too, like excessively when you lift, oh, it's probably because you're too shifted forward. And, and why am I too shifted forward? By your stomach. Because Alex has got a pump cover on all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. all the pump is in the stomach. <laughs> so how do you like the fact that people doubt you? Or do you... Do you just want to conquer them? Do you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, the, you said people were doubting you. Do you like that? Does, does that give you drive? Yes, or are you like, I want to prove you so wrong that you're never going to doubt me again? I've once heard, even like friendly things. Uh, I've had like this talk with a guy who came third at the university, at the university championship. He was like, oh yeah, but like a stop out of thing, you know, like, like never get really the numbers you get want. You never get really the ranking like you want. That's when I, when I first started powerlifting, I remember exactly what he said. And I have that in my mind like once a week. Yeah. And it's like, okay, cool. We'll see. And, yeah, it's uh, like that with me. Like when, when we started this podcast, you know, I, a lot of people I told about it and they were mostly positive, but there were a couple of people who were like, you know, oh yeah, you know, it's only a podcast, it's only this, it's only that. And they were really downplaying really, your, really, your achievements. And I've made a mental note of that now, and it's that's what's driving me. Really sort of, uh, Besides the fact we got absolutely soaked last night in uh, Knightsbridge or Mayfair. Yeah, Mayfair. Besides that, that's the driving factor behind this. And I think having people who doubt you is good. And I think having that sort of... And they'll always be there. Yeah. It's all, they'll always In fact, be there. it'll probably increase. Like you probably, do you, have, do you feel like you have more... People who doubt you now. Uh, more people, de- definitely more people. I feel like are. it, but it might also be me convincing myself that there are people without me. Is that what you need then? You need that to push forward. Yeah. If you nobody doubted you, if everyone said, yeah, Antoine's going to make it, would you just sort of slow down a bit? People say that more, but at the same time, I don't feel like I deserve it. I feel like I haven't accomplished something that is worth mentioning as such. That's, your, that's, that's, that's your why I want. That's why, like in 2023, I want the British record for total, mm. and I want to beat uh, the guy who is in first right now, mm-hmm. because then you can't say anything. 
there's no one ahead of you then is that so it's not, it's not in the like uk the, not but like then then we the leave world. then we leave the uk and we'll see so beyond so you, you can't you, you come to our country you compete for us you win and then you go somewhere else so in, a, in essence stronger, mate, isn't it? in essence you went world domination that's basically where you're world domination bro where your goal uh, is yeah like and you know like you know we talk about aggressive it's like aggressiveness and stuff yeah, aggression yeah, yeah aggression your training can go a long way if you have if you start actually trying <laughs> It's not, but the thing is, it isn't. But it seems weird when saying it like that. It isn't like, funny though because it's so true, and you you know me quite well, and you know my weaknesses because they're very obvious, and there are many of them. And when we train together, you can just see straight away like this. There are some things you just need to stop fucking up and everything. You know, I mean, not like massively. But it's not it's, like stop fucking up everything. Stop overthinking that you're shit. Stop thinking that like you're this, that, and so just fucking lift, man, and just like just try as hard as you can. Just push with your legs, man. So the problem is right when I'm when, if you weren't here, no, I would probably be that guy saying that. Saying it's obvious, just do. And then now that you're here, I'm realizing that I'm what I'm telling people to do is not necessarily what I do myself, and it actually reminds me that. I mean, to be fair, I feel the same sometimes. I feel, oh, yeah. I say these things, but I feel like I'm not like as disciplined as I could. Yeah, like, be. do as I say, not as I do. It comes I back like... to who you surround yourself with, though. I guess. Yeah. You know, if you surround yourself with people who are less than you, you know, well, no one is less than anyone. But you know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. You're going to feel a bit like we said in the last episode. You're going to compare down. You know, and that's not you something you want to do. Head. You always want to compare up, and, and you this wanna... is why you don't see elite level part of the journey training it. No, pure gyms. This is what we talked about yeah. gym environment. If you like, I feel like I am one of the strongest guys in my commercial gym, and that's laughable to you because when I train with you, you're much stronger than me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like I said this before, and I mean, I it's not this, laughable to me. But I said that re- well, I said it really lightly, but I said I've almost completed my commercial gym because I've sort of got to the top of the hierarchy. Of the, not not right at the top, but towards the top. I'm gonna so, lie. I'm gonna lie. You should just go to Barbican gym. The, the closest one is so far away. Because they will, like, destroy you. Mm, yeah, See, well, that's what I said. This, this is the well, exact actually, point that the, I have. The, the gym, that's the, the only real gym that I could go to to lift. Well, actually, PB has calibrated plates, and there's um, strong people there. And it has power lifters there as well. Yeah, but, um, yeah, that's true, actually. But uh, there's, a, there's another one, Welsh Red Barbell. Um, and that was actually the competition. When we went to see the competition, the guy who scored a 400 kilo, that was the Welsh Red Barbell Club. Um, competition. But I think it's more set up for equipped. I'm not entirely sure, actually. They got like monoliths there and stuff like that. But I think they do yeah, raw, equipped. Raw, yeah, yeah, obviously. I, I, IPF? No, 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 definitely not. I don't think it was. Backyard no. uh, federations? I don't know. Backyard <laughs> federations. I'm not shitting on it because it was a good comp and uh, they were a really, really good bunch of people. But the atmosphere think, there was really good I as well. I don't think it was IPF, but it was like wraps and I don't know. I don't really understand the rules with equipped or, you know, raw classic. But it looks like. Apparently, you can't put your feet in the bench now when you're setting up for bench. Uh, apparently now you need to have like a 90 degree angle with uh, the elbows on oh, the no, bench. you have to hit depth on bench now yeah depth on bench is a thing you just need to be parallel you don't need to be under but oh well am I, I, I'm I mean I'm completely player, ineffective maybe. so I don't give a shit so uh... <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the girls is the same for the women then yeah because some of the women now are going to have to yeah. really change up their for men it, it's probably not like, you know what of all things um, I think at the higher level it's not going to change much hmm. I think it's not going to change much for two reasons one because Generally, at the top, people just end up just being strong individuals. Period. Like, yeah. like you need okay. Like it's like part of thing is not just about strength; it's about how you express it with the, in the best way possible. You take advantage of every little thing, right? So it wouldn't be a thing if it, were, you know, what I mean, if we could do it. But at the same time, it's like you need to be fucking strong to sumo four hundred kilos of the fall on a stiff bar. Is sumo cheating? No. Well, he pulls sumo. I pull like frog style, you know what I mean? Yeah, you do. Yeah. You're not like wide. You kind of like. Yeah, I've seen some. I've seen some like range of motion in like powerlifting clips where like the bench is like they're like that, and they just like push it like down an inch. Well, I think that's banned now. Is it? That's that's yeah, what we're, that's what we're talking this about. Is banned now. Um, you can put your feet on the bench. You can put them too wide. Also on the platform. Uh, that's one of the things. Uh, that is going to be happening in 2023. I don't, honestly, like, uh, I don't really care. I think. Uh, yeah. I think it's good in general for if, like, it's it this way. It's about how you want the sport to look. Mm. And uh, if... Uh, yeah, because there's been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, bad uh, publicity around the, the, the you know, the, the technique where it's literally like an inch. Oh, if I could do that, I 100% would if it well, was Well, if about. it's legal, yeah, of course you would. Why wouldn't yeah. you? Your point, exactly. The point is to put as much, as much weight on the bar as possible. 
But you know, it's what, not like, about you know what's, what's well. I mean, it's legal now. So. The thing is, like, you're not gonna like at the high level when it comes to like full power, like squat, bench, and deadlift. Mm. All these guys that even even these guys that bench like really wide, they tend to be still strong. Like Owen Hubbard in the UK is like yeah, infamous, I guess, for benching with like an extremely arched style, extremely wide grip puts his head and his feet on the bench like no like he's like he has a style that is like now like regarded as like cheating Hubbard right? is he the one that sort of like basically snaps his neck when he's setting up yeah that's him <laughs> uh, and the I'll thing show is, you a video uh, later but okay. he basically gets, comes yeah. back when he puts I don't know how he does that on a new IPF bench his thing is rock as a is hard as a rock <laughs> I know it's, it's like terrible paper. but anyway uh, the thing is this guy still calls grips to 15 kilos 215 yeah. bench. Yeah. Close grip. Wow. Yeah. So the thing is, even though this guy is like, I mean, he's go he's going from 83 to 93 now. And the thing is, the thing is, people will just have to put on more muscle on their body, but like, these guys will still remain really fucking strong. Like, it's not because he benches that way, but he's weak. Like, Shen Noriga, flat-backed, 190 kilos, first in competition is 215. But flat back mm. with more range of motion than if it was like just with the new IPF rules. Yeah. Like, yeah. like he he can still do a lot. It's uh it's more like the people that are at the top are just strong individuals. And they will find and not only are they strong, they're also driven. Yeah. They will find a way to stay at the top. Mm. It's not like the landscape is gonna change. Yeah. This actually doesn't change much. And it's like very, very, actually, very few people bench with that style, because it's really, it's really genetics dependent. Yeah, I don't have the flexibility to get into that position. <laughs> Mate, God, my, no, my back is so pumped I can't even arch it properly. There's so much blood in there, you know, because I'm so pregnant. Apparently, <laughs> you're impregnated yeah. by but your look, own weight. Look. I really stuck with you, huh? <laughs> Good. Yeah, it's, it's, Good. It's, it's, look, look, look. I, I wanna, took it personally. Right. Okay. 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 I want to wrap up now. Um, I want to finish on a little point about coaching. What, yeah. what are your plans externally of competing? Do you plan to coach people? I know you said you don't think you're quite ready for that, but, you know, for example... I don't think I'm ready for this. You could coach me. I've, I'm completely yeah, amateur. Uh, I'm not opposed. It's yeah. more like... You just bully me and make me Clementine so that I can cut down... My on coaching it. is adaptive, Good. you get me? I, I adapt to the individual I'm faced with. I adapt to pregnant women too. <laughs> but, there we are. Oh you're sorted. God, I don't like it. Anymore. But the thing is, my point is, um, I plan. I'm, I, I will get a job once I'm done with uni. But at the same time, I plan on coaching on the side because I actually find it fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually started coaching Ali, and she's making gains. Yeah, she told us yesterday. She's making. She's wait. She says she's making gains. Hmm? Did she say she's making gains? Oh, she just said that if she messed up on a lift, that you would just say that was shit. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, in her words, it was a wishy washy compliment. I never, say, I never told her it was shit. I'm actually very like calm with her. I'm yeah, like, yeah. don't worry too much. Like, it's going to be okay. I actually do a lot of like positive affirmation. Oh, well, I wish you were like that with me. No, but like, that doesn't you work. don't need it, Al. You don't, don't deserve need, no, it. I don't need that that. Not only does he, it doesn't work on him. <laughs> no, I think with Alex, you've got to be uh, you, you stern. Need, you need to bully him. Yeah, I think so. You do. You do. I deserve it. I, I don't deserve it. Like, kindness. you need to adapt to the people you coach. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. have the same type for everyone. But anyway. Uh, not the same program, but um, I think it's fun. I actually learned a lot doing it. Like, obviously, yeah, yeah. like, Ellie is a very different lifter from me. Mm. And, uh, no, it was actually, it's actually quite fun. And I learned. Good, good, like, good. And I learned, and like, you know, sometimes I go like, I want to try something and I want to see if <laughs> so it works. So what is your guinea pigs then, essentially? You can try new things out so you don't get injured, is it? I mean, she just did her max squat for an RP 8.5. Yeah, we, we, yeah Eight, we, actually. We, I went to the session yesterday. Um, I was talking to them there. And uh, yeah, she, yeah she's, she's, her technique's looking good. Um, she's getting stronger. On deadlifts, deadlifts is I where I need her to. Dead, yeah. Or deadlifts is She said she hurt here. herself as well. Yeah, anyway, she we did to me in the back. Yeah, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she hurt herself and we started again with me and now she has no pain. It's more like... So if you want to get rid of your pain, guys... Uh, so your rehab... This is, rehab okay, program. no, no, okay, okay. I, I, want to, I actually have a rent on injuries. Oh, well, sorry. I fucking hate it. Like, I just fucking hate when people say, oh, if you do this, you're going to get injured. Yeah, we yeah that annoys me. Or if, we, you, we if, or if you do this, you will never get injured. If I do an SPD, I'm going to die. <laughs> it's 
Sorry, say. It's like, like you know, the thing is like injuries nowadays are like so much more complex than we thought they were. Mm. Like, and also they're multifactorial. Might just be fatigue, might just be lack of sleep, might just be bad hydration, might just, so many. You, Cigars, but then it's so. cigar. The, the thing is like, there's so many things that can happen in so many contexts. It's not always because it's heavy. Mm. The thing is like Panagiri Starinidis, who is like the best 66 currently in the world, I guess. He's French and he was going to compete at the Arnold UK. He twisted his back. He he like hurt his back with 70 kilos on squats. Mm. Mm-hmm. How? Can, 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 exactly. Can tell me, can someone tell me how? Because I have no fucking clue. Yeah, yeah. if he's used to such a heavy load, you'd think 70 keg would be, would be nothing from that. But that's I the mean, first plate, isn't it? In, in powerlifting. Yeah. It'd be like the first step yeah. of warming up. Yeah. Well, it can happen, right? That's, that sucks, right? And the thing yeah. is, like, the thing is, right? Like, you can't just, like, say, oh, like, this did it, this did that. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Like, okay, like, it's different if you hurt yourself consecutively on the same thing. Like me, I just have a tendency to throw my hip out when I high bar heavy. Mm. When I high bar squat heavy, I tend to have my left hip that just says goodbye. <laughs> so... In that context, I can pinpoint what's the variable. Mm. But in most cases, you generally cannot. What you know, though, is where you're hurt. What you know is, like, what movements hurt. And what you should do is not think, oh, what the fuck hurt me? What happened? Is more be geared towards the future and think, how can I How do I get out yeah. of there? Like, where does it hurt? Assess where it hurts tries to slowly get back into the movements that hurt you. Mm. This is what we're talking about with like the guy that never did in 20 years. Maybe he had deadlifted like just after and just like assess where he's hurt. And if he had deadlifted like as a rehab, you know what I mean? Mm. Maybe he wouldn't be in pain because he would have gotten rid of that fear and that pain at that time. Yeah, and he could have built some new muscle tissue around it to sort of pad himself from being I mean, yeah, injured. 100%. Or like sometimes, you know, it's just a spasm. Like sometimes you just have a spasm and it's like, you need to untwist it. How do you untwist it? You just squat again. And if anyone wants to hear about um, the spasms you can experience as a pregnant woman or an overweight man, I'm your guy. Um, and with that said, I'd love to talk to you all day about this, but we're going to do a session now. We're going to film that where we can talk more about injury prevention, warming up. Um, oh, you mean not warming up? <laughs> yeah, the lack <laughs> yes. of warming oh, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll, we'll, Bring we'll, it on. we'll do a masterclass on that. But Antoine, it actually has been a pleasure to have you on. Um, I know good. you don't think you're, you're you're worthy of the top spot yet, but honestly, I th- I think you're fantastic. You've done really you've done really well, and um, I think you're a good addition to the sport. So uh, so thank you for coming on, Matthew. I think has enjoyed the conversation too. It's been new for me. I've I've enjoyed this a lot. I've taken some insight from your world. Um, Obviously, I'm not a bodybuilder at all, uh, but I do enjoy having a rave experience. You look at me, you're way more of a bodybuilder than I am. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I have enjoyed speaking to you. It's been new. Uh, I think a lot of value can be taken from what you said, especially from any powerlifters that listen to our, our podcast. I know there are a few. I've spoken to a few. And I think that your perspective on the sport and what you can do and your mindset and your discipline and stuff can really carry on to what they believe and how they think and act. And uh, I just want to thank you for taking your time to come down to... Uh, to see us yeah, and speak even to us. He was late. And uh, now we're going to eat food and uh, lift weight. Yeah. So there's nothing really more to say, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and um, I yeah. hope everyone has a nice day. Thank you, Antoine. <laughs>